Hello, and welcome to this uh, presentation on profile IO and user drivers on Android Things. My name is uh, Sandra Alvarez. I am on the Android Things team uh, in Intel here in Jones Farm, uh, GF1. Uh, we are a small team uh, that enables um, that enables um, Intel architectures on Android Things. So right now we have uh, the Edison and the Jewel, but I'll talk about that uh, more uh, as as we go through the slides. Uh, if you want to get hold of us, um, you can uh, either reach uh, reach out to me or my manager Gitanjali Krishna, or, uh, or the software architect Bruce Bear. All right. If you're familiar with Android Things, well, it's a it's an IoT uh, offering from Google, the only IoT offering from Google, and um, we'll see how it differs from Google at the beginning, and uh, then uh, specifically tackle user drivers in peripheral I/O, which is the main entrant, uh, the the main service or library entrant in the Android world, um, and see how to use it. I'll. Uh, I'll I have a little demo. I'll uh, open up Android Studio and do some programming and show you a um, blink and LED or two. Uh, the agenda for today is uh, a brief introduction to, um, to Android things. Uh, there's a full deck of slides, so I'm not going to go uh, uh, into all the things that, uh, that Android things entails, but mainly focus on um, oh, what are the new things that came in, and what you should uh, be looking out for as an app developer. Uh, the Think Support Library is the new entrant in this field. Uh, uh, it is what enables and uh, provides APIs, enables us to communicate with uh, peripherals on the uh, on connected to your board. Um, it can be broken down into user drivers and peripheral I.O. Uh, we'll, um, We'll go into depth on peripheral I.O. and I'll do some live uh, coding on Android Studio and show you how easy it is to maybe blink an LED, um, uh, 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 do a buzzer, or read, uh, read a sensor. I'll also introduce, uh, for those of you not aware, UPM and Mara. They're two open source IoT libraries uh, that Intel has been involved in for quite some time, two to three years. And we have managed to bring all that goodness that's available under all other platforms and integrated with Android Things and made it available for Android developers. I'll show some um, takeaway links uh, if you want to get involved. Um, and yeah, that'll be that. We'll take some questions at the end. So these are the uh, Intel boards that are available on Android Things. Uh, there's Intel Edison and the Jewel. Um, well, uh, uh, these starter boards are come with, you know, these SOMs are put on these starter boards. And these boards basically break out pins, all the pins that are available on a particular device uh, and on a particular SOM. And you can use them for prototyping uh, your product. Well, these are big boards. And you don't want, want always your product to be big. So what you do is just once you're ready and happy with your product, you unplug the SOM, design a small board around uh, that fits your dimensions for the product, and get rid of the starter board. So this is the reason, uh, I guess, we start with starter boards on uh, for prototype, mainly based for prototyping. Another benefit of having this SOM um, is that um, uh, they are already, um, Intel has uh, uh, managed to um, have all the permissions to sell this uh, any product that is based on SOM, like FCC and things like that, I believe. So uh, you don't have to go through all that testing and uh, uh, verification and getting permissions to sell your product. It's much quicker to product with these boards, which is a, which is a big plus in when you developing using Android things. All right, we, as Android developers, uh, we are aware of uh, the stack. And what Google did was uh, they took this stack and they s s uh, sliced things that they don't really require on an IoT device. Uh, they, they could be a device without a screen. Um, there's always um, no user, uh, there could be very less or no user interaction. So they have removed certain um, services 
and apps that uh, that make sense on a mobile phone or a tablet, and uh, left everything else intact. So it's a it's a, it has a big footprint. Um, and it's a it's a full blown Android uh, system. So um, devices that have at least half a gig of memory uh, will uh, will need to can can I think run uh, can run this uh, um, operating system. Uh, and enough processing power for uh, for Java and uh, Dalvik VMs to run, multiple VMs to run. Okay, so uh, make sure if you're going to uh, if you're going to start working on some project, uh, go to the website. I'll show you the links uh, and check if the services that you might be looking for are available. Well, this is how the for this is the the snapshot for now. The the I, I know uh, that there are um, boards that are going to come from. Qualcomm being uh, having modem, so maybe telephony will come back in in some form. So um, this is uh, not set in stone, and we are still on a developer preview. Um, so things are changing uh, very quickly and on need basis. Another thing I want to point out is that uh, there's no APIs for user authentication or credentials or giving permissions. So your app uh, would have to have permissions uh, by default. And statically given, so you have location and uh, things like that, right? Uh, camera, all those permissions uh, are statically done, and there's no user input saying okay, yes or no. So that is another thing to keep in mind. Uh, the drivers, the HAL, uh, pretty much um, stays the same from Android with little or no modification, um, and um, uh, this whole package will be uh, put on board. Uh, Google uh, wants to make sure that that all the devices uh, that are on the uh, in outside in the field are running Android things can be updated or when uh, when they want. So they are going to keep hold of this whole uh, package, the BSP package. So uh, vendors are not uh, responsible uh, for the operating system that's running on the devices, but they, they can update only the application. So that's another thing. There's a whole topic, I guess, of OTAs that we can talk. There should be a talk about mm, people interested, but you won't go through that, uh, through any of that here. All right. Um, let's check on this. All right. Um, the Android Things stack, the simplified version of it, and that's uh, the big uh, orange block that is introduced uh, to the Android world. Uh, a new set of APIs that extend uh, the core Android framework and uh, help you integrate with new types of uh, hardware. Um, well, uh, uh, this is, uh, although it's up and I've not uh, put it as part of native C, C++ libraries. It is really written in C, C++, and there are Java uh, headers for it uh, to communicate with the, with the framework. So there's a native header, there's native header, so you can um, develop it and, 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 and communicate with uh, using NDK applications as well. Also, Android Things is a streamline for, a sing for single application use. And I will show you in the in, in, when I open the Android Studio application uh, how they do that. But what this means is that at the end of boot, at the end of Android Things boot, you will have a your default application running and no home screen. There's no home screen. Your default application automatically launches as the first application at the end. And from there on, what you want to do is up to your uh, design of the application. So let's break down the things in Pro library. There's uh, two components, uh, Profilio and user drivers. Uh, I've put them side by side, but they are really on one on top of the other. Uh, Profilio being the the one uh, uh, that communicates with sen center sensors and actuators. Uh, we'll see how in a bit. So they uh, Google supports industry standard protocols and interfaces like I2C, Spy, um, and there's uh, more and more being added. Uh, as time goes on, as uh, as there is need uh, for these devices, uh, one major thing that's missing right now is A to D, but I believe there's uh, work being done to uh, add support for this. So peripheral I/O, low layer uh, user driver encapsulates these APIs on top and uh, injects whatever 
events, you, whatever information you get from sensors uh, or input devices or GPS into the framework. So, uh, so, so application, Java applications can register to these um, events and act accordingly. So it's more of uh, one top of each other. Now, um, what, uh, so what does that do? Uh, how does it help us? Well, you can write a, a very generic user driver for input or a very generic user driver for a sensor. Because uh, although it can be an accelerometer, it could, it could be a temperature sensor, it could be any kind of sensors. Um, uh, what user driver really does is helps existing Android developers who have no idea of, uh, of how uh, the, the, uh, the, the bits and pieces of connecting pins and uh, they try to make that simple. At the same time, um, uh, Android developers who are already familiar with a sensor framework that, had, that existed in, um, in, uh, in mobiles and tablets, uh, user drivers help, help uh, inject your uh, information into into the sensor framework. So, um, so existing application developers who know Android can just use that sensor framework. So that that is all that user drivers do. It's a it's a layer that basically you can reuse uh, for different uh, different kinds of devices. If it's an input device, be being a keyboard or a touch screen. Uh, if it's different kinds of sensors. Right. Uh, another thing about it is since it lies in uh, the framework um, uh, or in Java, it, it, it can be reused on multiple platforms and there's easy portability. Uh, if you can move from x86 to uh, ARM architectures, uh, no problem. Uh, peripheral IO is the, is the, is the real uh, deal in this uh, interesting support library. What it does, yeah, there's, there's, there's a whole uh, um, logic here that that basically uh, sets up a communication path uh, to your pin on the board uh, with your application. And by doing that, it, it enables um, high-level language languages to communicate with very low-level devices. You don't have to write uh, bash scripts well, you can't write bash, bash uh, any any sort of bash stuff on production devices because of SA Linux that won't allow you to touch any of these sysfs files. So you can uh, write Java applications. Also, it abstracts a lot of low-level communication and configuration, which I'll show you uh, once I do some coding. And um, uh, another important thing it does is it gives you serialization and mutual exclusion of the resource. Uh, if you set up a path, uh, suppose you take a GPIO and and and, and um, your application is trying to use that GPIO, another application, or even if you have forgotten what you're doing and you try to um, mux that GPIO to a spy while it is in use, um, Peripheral Manager is going to say no, you can't do it. So it gives you serialization and mutual exclusion of a particular resource. Um, it also maps any drivers that are written on top of it to pretty much all the hardware that is available, uh, uh, that you, Android Things is available on. So you, you can plug your temperature sensor into a um, into a uh, Intel Edison uh, and run your application. Um, unplug it, plug it on a Jew, plug it on an ARM Raspberry Pi board, and it's it's that easy. Uh, there's very, very little changes that you have to worry about. Uh, one of the biggest uh, problems as an embedded developer is pin muxing. Oh, how do I get to a pin mux? Uh, how, do I get, uh, how do I get to a pin? Oh, it's not working. Um, why? Because there's a GPIO expander uh, connected. So I have to, in order to get to a pin on the board, I have to not just, uh, you know, uh, uh, configure one, I2C maybe, a GP expander on an I2C, but also go to, so there's, there's a lot of complexity. And Intel, uh, Intel's Arduino board is a very, very good example for that. Uh, so all of this complexity is hidden from, from 
uh, from you. It's part of the device hell, and it's up to the the device vendors, like Intel, to write this hell and 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 then basically in, uh, encapsulate all this information of uh, how to get to a pin. All that you need to do as an app developer is just know which pin you're connecting to, just the name of the pin, and what function you want it to perform, and you use uh, the right APIs to ask for that pin, and all of this will be done for you. And it's a huge sigh of relief for, for application developers who don't really want to know the nitty-gritty details about how boards and muxing works. All right, we had a hackathon uh, last week, I believe, uh, at OSDS. Um, and this is an Android Things uh, a board running Android Things, the green thing that's a jewel, and has a camera module that's sticking out there. And it was uh, our uh, zombie detector. And so many things running on this uh, device, um, all made possible on Android Things platform. There was a jewel um, with a camera. TensorFlow, so we, we, we had a data set of um, zombie, uh, uh, zombies that, uh, that TensorFlow could classify. So we put on the device. This device is not connected to the internet uh, in any way. So all of it was on the device. And it managed to, looking at a picture, um, managed to classify whether it was a zombie or not. So uh, there's a bunch of sensors. Uh, the blue thing right there is what I'm going to use today. It's a sensor hub. Um, we wanted to uh, also uh, show how you could uh, talk to different sensors and not just the camera and the tensor flow. So we demonstrated how you could, there's an LED, uh, sorry, uh, there's an LED a buzzer, uh, a temperature sensor, and uh, humidity pressure sensors that we got, uh, we uh, managed to communicate with. And all of this was done using Cordova uh, and JavaScript. So. So yes, we, we managed to write JavaScript, uh, in, in, write programs JavaScript to get to devices that are connected on the Jewel. All right. So uh, I don't know if there is a if there's code available for this, but uh, uh, I guess I can find out if you all are interested. And this particular one, it uh, the interesting part about this was it would uh, look at a picture of human, and depending on the shadows, eye shadows, or if you're making funny faces, it would say, "Okay, you are 75% zombie." So it's a very interesting uh, demo. Uh, let's assume you have a Intel uh, Arduino board, and uh, in order to begin programming, and for example, just uh, blink in LED, all you need is the hardware, which is the board, a breadboard. Uh, in the LED with a register, so you don't blow it up. Blow it up, uh, and the pin diagram is the pin out, and it's available on 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 online. Uh, shows you basically which pins uh, can do what. And um, here we have uh, pin thirteen, which is IO thirteen right here. Um, this is connected to the uh, to the LED, uh, so. We have to uh, ask for that pin. So we take an instance of uh, Profile Manager service, and 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 right here, we say the GPI name IO13 Manager uh, Open GPIO GPIO name. That's all you need to do to get to that LED, and then you can use all the other methods that are available, like uh, set the direction. Um, set the value to true and it will blink. Set to false, it will go off. If you, for example, if you don't have an LED and if you have a button over there, then you could use you could use that pin to register a GPIO callback, and when and set the trigger, maybe for both or just up or down. And when you press the button, if you set it for for both, when you press the button, your callback will be called, and you can maybe blink an LED or or do something, um, um, and when you release the button, you can do all. Uh, you can do something else. Well, um, what it doesn't give you is the whole debounce and things like that. So you have to make sure that you uh, uh, take care of debounce and all the other things. But but you can get to your your button by only giving the name 
of the GPIO it's connected to. And it makes it very simple, right? So at this point of time, I think I am going to go and open my Android Studio. Uh, I'll also go through, well, this is the Android Things GitHub. And this is the Android Things GitHub and uh, the, the landing page for all, um, let me go there. For all the different applications uh, and examples uh, Google has provided. And what I'll do is I'll start with, so, okay. Um, so simple, if you're familiar with the uh, Java programming in Android Studio, uh, they use Gradle as their build script. And then you have the uh, app, Android manifest file. And this is the time to show you that the Android manifest file uses an intent called IoT launcher. So what it does is that when whenever you have this application on the device, that will be, this application will be the first thing that 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 uh, an Android Things uh, booting device launches. So that is one thing to to note here. That is an IoT launcher which you wouldn't see on uh, regular Android uh, applications. Any of the main activity Java file. Okay. So what I have done is I have cloned that project, and um, and opened it in Android Studio. I'm using Android Studio uh, 3.0. It's a canary build, but this one supports uh, uh, Android Things applications by default. So you can just uh, start off with an Android Things activity. Um, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to use this one. Um, all right. So this is what it looks like, and uh, the main files to look at. We all looked at the XML. This is this is one we want to see. All right. Let's go to this one. All right. It's a Gradle file for the module. And uh, here, let's forget about the top line for now. Here is what the header comes from. This is the Android Things Developer Preview 4. And it provides all the headers uh, and APIs that are available in Android Things Library, which I'm going to use through this. And uh, that is what I will use in here. Okay, so let's do that. Uh, import. Um, let's make sure I don't. Come the Google uh, Android things. Uh, so this is what I need definitely, and I also want a help. Uh, before I get, go any further, let me show you what I have here connected. It was sharing. All right. This is what I have. It's an Intel Edison with a shield. There are doing a shield that basically just gives me connectors to connect to this hub. It's a hub that we designed and 3D printed as a display, uh, which I'm not going to use, um, a buzzer an LED, a BME280 um, ambient temperature, pressure, humidity sensor, and a TMP sensor, which is, um, I'm not going to use that. I'll just use these three for today, OK? And um, um, I have put the buzzer in the LED so that I can show you uh, uh, once. And then if the buzzer's, uh, buzzer runs, uh, it's, it's easier for me not to uh, switch back and forth from the camera. So if the buzzer runs, you know that it's working uh, if you hear the buzzer. All right. So let's go back to Android Studio. OK. What I'm going to do. And this code gives a example code here, is, uh, which I'm going to utilize. All right. And this is the default. You have the on create and the on destroy um, methods for the main activity. Pretty much the same stuff that you would find in um, in Android. All right. So we find a parameter for manager service. So this equals a new performance manager service. And I'll 
first of what I want to do is I want to uh, log something that's available. I'm going to log what are the GPS that are available for me on this particular device because I have no idea that this device is even able to see uh, the GPIOs that I'm seeing on um, I'm seeing on the um, pinout, right? So let's see. Well, you're off. Service. I'll do the buzzer as well. And for the buzzer, I'm going to use PWM. PWMs. And that's it. I'm going to run this. Building and running. I'll also open my locket. Uh, there's a previous application here that died uh, because the new one is running. So, uh, so I had the device connected. And launching activity. Boom. I have, yes, I have a plenty of GPIOs that I can use. And I have PWMs to PWMs. I will have to give these names for the PWMs. All right. So let's go ahead and do that uh, real quick. Uh, take a GPIO in GPIO and say service. Uh, open GPIO. GPIO is connected to IO2. Okay, now um, there's an exception, so I'll just use try as put it on a try and catch that exception. I'll also, what I need to do is set the direction of this GPIO first. So set the direction to GPIO. There's some in direction out initially low. And then GPIO, set value. True. Okay. Let you turn on my LED. I'll put a sleep here and turn it off. See that. Two seconds. And oh, there's another exception here. Let's handle that too. And end. And GPIO dot set value false. Okay. We also have PWM, so let's do that too. PWM and buzz. Similar method. Let's say open. You can see that there's all kinds of devices that I can open here. And what is it connected to? It's connected to IO5 on my device. I'll show it to you in a bit. And what I want to do, oh, it needs that header. Add that, please. It needs a M buzz. Um, set the cycle first. It's a very low value here. Um, it only takes between 1 to 100. So um, the buzzer goes crazy and it's, uh, it's a bad sound if it's 100. So I'm going to keep it low. And uh, then say, please enable and 20 seconds. So let's run this device. Um, and while it does, I will switch to here, let's see if it runs. There you go. All right, if you can't see what I'm typing, uh, I guess. So I didn't do much here. It was quite easy, um, what I did if you missed that. Um, I just added open the GPIO that was connected on IO2, um, set the direction, set the value. Same thing I did with PWM. Just make sure that you get the name right where it's connected to. Um, set the GT cycle and enabled it and disabled it. All right. That's all I've done. Mm, next thing I want to do is go back to my slides. Similar way, you have I2C. And I'll demonstrate an I2C with UPM and MRA uh, and, not, uh, and not using a profile IO because uh, We've done all this work, and there's a lot of uh, um, sensors that you can choose from. I'm going to use uh, this uh, 
BMP280 to show you how easy it is to, to do it through UPM and RAP. Okay, so same thing for I2C, you just require the I2C name and the address. And sometimes you don't require that if you, this is through Perfil Manager. If you're using uh, the UPM driver, all of this you don't have to worry about. You just have to say that this is my default and it knows what address it will have and basically goes and initiates that driver. Okay, same thing for SPY, same thing for UART. And the slides for you to refer to if what methods are available because you can always go on, um, on Google landing page. And uh, PWM, which is what we saw right now. All right, UPM and MRA. UPM and MRA are two open source libraries. Uh, and if you see this blue thing here, uh, UMRA basically sits in the user space, but it uh, sits on top of uh, uh, the kernel and uses SFS to communicate with uh, all these uh, peripherals. And UPM sensors are on top of it, it uses MRA APIs to uh, basically uh, configure um, your sensor or calibrate your sensor. And on top of that, your example, you can just say, hey, initialize this particular sensor for me and I'll do, I'll do all that underneath it. So what we've done, oh, and before that, what was the UPM MRA really for? And at this point of time, I should also say that the UPM and MRA guys, uh, the lead, you, Tudor, uh, Tudor is, have, uh, is giving a talk tomorrow uh, about this and what they do. So if you want to go for that, uh, please do so. Uh, that will be an interesting talk on what these libraries really uh, really give you in, in, in the IoT development world. Okay, so a lot of protocols that are supported, uh, plenty of um, operating systems, and I think this is the new one right now. And they have maker as well as industry sensors that, that they're enabling on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, so, so that's great. All right. Um, what did we do? Well, we took UPM and RA. I would also like to tell you that there is, although the UPM and RA are written in C, C++, using SWIG, they provide headers for pretty much uh, Java, Node.js, and Python. So everything, uh, really. We can write applications using all of these um, languages. So what we did was we took the UPM Java header and made it available for Java Android Things applications. And we stripped MRA to a, to a shim layer that basically this one, since it cannot talk to the Linux kernel directly, it just goes through Peripheral Manager. And Peripheral Manager has a native interface, so that's what it talks to. And from there on, it is up to the Android Things and Peripheral Manager to set up that connection for you. And these packages are available on, uh, on uh, JSender. So you, that's what you need to pull your AR from uh, in Gradle. So they are available. And there's a, there's all, almost 200 of them that you can use right now on Android Things. All right. What are the benefits that you, uh, UPM RAW bring to Android Things? Well, there's over 200 sensors multiple buses, uh, UPM and MRA availability on a familiar development development platform. So Android uh, developers don't have to go to the nitty gritty details of, hey, what the sensor, how do I calibrate the sensor? How do I talk to the sensor? There are examples available uh, where you just cannot in, in initiate sometimes and start uh, reading from it. You might have to do one step in between. So you need to know uh, what are the steps to basically talk to a sensor. And there are examples available for each and every one in all kinds of all of those languages that are supported. Um, and it is a successful development model so far. Um, well, I'll let it speak for itself. This is the this is where it is, and there's plenty of activity here. Um, so this is UPM useful packages and modules. So if you want to go there, you can. You can take a look at this. I have the upm.mrata.io and mrata.io being the, the websites, right? 
So yes, um, it's a successful platform. So there is no change done in the way UPMMR works. UPMMR folks do their thing, and what we do is we uh, uh, we do a a, a build for uh, x86 architectures. For now, it's already it's only supported on x86 platforms. Although you can merge and support uh, um, Arc, a lot of other platforms, and um, um, we host, we do all this stuff without touching the way UPMMR works. Okay, uh, so those are the benefits. And there's a census we've gotten. There's some questions here. One question, how easy to get Android phone sensors to my apps on any native API available? Android phone sensors. Well, Android, um, right now your Android phone is running Android and not Android things. So in order to get to those sensors, um, you would really have to uh, go through, because this is Android things in, uh, library not available right now on, that, on, those, uh, on those platforms. So you would need Android things on it, which is not really uh, a good thing to put on your phone, really, because uh, there's no telephony and things like that. So right now, there's no support. But I know that there is an effort to put Android things uh, into the general Android platform. So maybe, the, uh, maybe in the future, it will be supported, but not right now. Second, yes, I'm also interested in how Facebook user sensors already available on the phone. Yes, can't use them right now. Uh, unless uh, you are a vendor and you can access the hell and write the, um, uh, write the SE Linux uh, policies for it and uh, make it available, or you have a phone like the Nexus, you can plug in and uh, uh, a rooted phone, basically. Um, only then can you write probably native applications, but Android Things library is not present. So you can't do what I'm doing right now on those devices. You will need a startup board and an Android Things uh, image, and this is the only way to get to it, all right? Uh, you're welcome. All right, um, I guess I'll do one more bit here, just real quick. I'll import, um, oh, before I do that. I have to show you something here. This is the line that I didn't. Basically, what it does is it pulls UPM uh, BMP280 um, AR and makes it available for you to, 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 to code, okay? This, oh, all right, so I say UPM underscore BMP280 dot BMP, nice and twist. Uh, this is one library meant for BMP as well as BNE. They're two different versions of the sensor capable of doing um, different things. Okay, so make sure you have that right. You say BMP and sensor and new BMP. This. What I've done here is MRA traditionally only understands digits, like MRA numbers. So uh, we have also introduced a, a lookup function. So you can give the name of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the I2C. It's an I2C sensor. So you can give the name of the I2C bus and the address. Uh, but BME, uh, right now I'm just using the simple stuff there. Take my default I2C, so zero just corresponds to the default one, and search for uh, the address that is already available in the sensor, and make sure you initialize my BME sensor uh, on that particular bus. So all that you know is, on a, and I know that on our in, Intel Arduino board, there's only one bus available, which is I2C6, okay? Uh, now, another thing I was saying is, when you're using this particular sensor, you have to do a do an update before you read from it. So all these things are are available on uh, are available on the on the UPM raw examples. So you would 
No, for a BME, you do that. For a TMP, the other temperature sensor, you don't need to do that. You have to uh, set it in active mode and not standby mode. So, you know, each sensor has its own things to do. So make sure you read through the examples as well before you start coding. And what I'm going to do is log. I'm at. Give me the temperature. Plus an F and what's this? And humidity. Humidity in this room right now. Plus an F. Sensor dot. See all these. These is this is all the stuff that you can get from the sensor, so easily um, available here, right? Um, it's a and and sensor dot bed. Oh, there wasn't pressure. Right. Yeah, Maybe it was pressure. Let's take the humidity that I crash. And that's it. What I'm going to do is I guess I'll delete that sensor at the end of it. Delete. Run this application. And I'll also look at that. It's launching, takes a bit. Um, like I said, the previous one goes dead, and then the new one should launch. There you go. And if you see here, it has the temperature answer, the temperature and the pressure printed. Okay, so there you go. You have managed to read from a sensor by just knowing where it's connected. And that's it. All right, and that should be it from me. This is the ending pages. There's a, you can just go and show you right here. You say Android things. This is the GitHub. You also have control. control. Also have a, a Android things. Okay. And there you go. They're getting started. Slide. So it gives you a hardware section, which pretty basically gives you all the kits that are available, the Edison Jewel, NXP, Raspberry Pi, and you can look at the pinout right here. This is the pinout I had shared. And um, yeah, and go from there. SDK provides all the APIs that are available. Uh, uses space drivers and some samples, all right? So thanks for attending, everyone. Um, so find out uh, we have a, we have shared it internally, but I, I'm going to see if I can share it on a, on the on the external um, Intel network. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, and I will end this here. Have a good one, everybody. <laughs>